I have. I think I see a whole bunch of people who uh, are not going to learn all that much about PDF today. But well, if I say something that's wrong, then you can correct me. <laughs> you really want to uh, play it that way? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not. I'm not afraid of you. <laughs> who knows? I might learn something. It's not impossible. But this is a presentation I've given before for the Gantt World Group, actually. So if it's wrong, then I said wrong things to a lot of people. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to start and uh, we'll see. Um, uh, it, like I said, if you, want to, if you want to interrupt, then you can. This is a, a standard presentation I've given before uh, that I've uh, got some, some slides from I will try to make this a little a little bigger. Um, I could probably make it full screen as well, but that sounds like uh, oh, actually. Let's see if that works. Can you see the presentation? Yeah. Great. Yes. Um, now your video tracks are over half of my presentation, but well. Okay, so like I said, this is a standard presentation. I just took one of the presentations I had because it gives me something to talk about. I don't just want to uh, sit here and talk. Uh, what I promised I was going to talk about is PDF, PDFX, and Gantua Group specs. And we'll see how far we get with that. Um, I'm assuming that all of you know what PDF is. If not, you might be in the wrong, in the wrong cafe. Uh, and given that we also don't serve beer, uh, it's not a good strategy. So I'm assuming that I can skip what PDF is and why PDF was, uh, was important. Although I found when I give trainings that a lot of people don't realize that PDF was not invented for graphic arts. It was just an accident that we ended up with it. Uh, it was originally invented to do uh, things like um, documentation, both on the internet and uh, just electronic documentation. And after the second or third version, um, it started being complete enough to also be used in, uh, in graphic arts and now we're stuck with it. So. What you also probably know, or should know at least, is that this is an ISO standard. So we're, we're going to talk about PDFX, and everyone, I think, knows that PDFX is an ISO standard. But the PDF specification itself is also an ISO standard. Uh, it used to be owned by Adobe up until PDF 1.8, I think, is the latest version. Uh, it used to be owned by Adobe, and then Adobe donated it to ISO, and it's now maintained by, by ISO. So new versions of the specification that come out, of the standard, I should say, that come out, um, are released by, uh, by ISO, which coincidentally means you can't get it for free anymore because you have to pay for ISO standards. So if you want the official PDF standard, then you have to, uh, you have to pay for it in Swiss francs, I don't know how many. Um, let's talk about something that is more interesting for graphic arts people and that's PDFX. There should be people who know this. Usually when I give training, nobody knows this, but in this crowd, someone must, must know the answer. Uh, what does the X come from in PDFX? Exchange. Yes. Um, more specifically, blind exchange, because that was the, the whole purpose of, uh, uh, behind PDFX was blind exchange. So um, people wanted to be able to create advertisements, for example, and save the advertisement in, in a certain format and then throw it over the wall to a printer and the printer or the publisher would use it and it would look exactly as it was expected. And I don't know whether I have this in this uh, presentation. So this is blind exchange, 
No, I don't think I have it in this presentation. There is actually a really cool movie on uh, on YouTube if you look for it. The uh, around PDFX, a very old movie advertising uh, the use of uh, PDFX. I might have it on a slide later on, uh, at least a, a preview of it. Uh, it's worth looking at, although it's 16 minutes and nothing happens. So for today's standards, it's a really slow moving thing. That's a banjo movie? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, that's funny. Uh, made in, I don't know, 2000 and to 2003 probably so it's it goes it goes way back so the x comes from blind exchange and the um the purpose was to say well if you have pdf then the chances of success with just pdf are, are relatively relatively low uh, it's not because you give someone a, a pdf file that they are going to be able to handle it without uh, without any problem and so if you give them something else, can we make the process more reliable? If I want to give an advertisement to a publisher, can I do something so that uh, the chance that he actually eventually prints what I, what I thought I was going to get, that that chance goes up? And the answer to that was, was PDFX. And how do you increase reliability? Well, you mostly increase rel reliability by, um, forbidding certain things. PDF is a very broad format. It can contain all kinds of stuff that you don't know what to do with in a graphic arts workflow or uh, that could cause uncertainty as to what you want. And uh, in PDFX, a lot of these things are, uh, are forbidden. You are not allowed to use them because whoever prints it might not know how to handle that file. Yeah, so you can you can use this image of um, these Russian dolls as a good example, and I will put some labels on the smaller ones as well soon. But it's a good example. If you have PDF, then PDFX is, fits inside. Every PDFX is a PDF. Not every PDF is a PDFX uh, file. And meanwhile. I don't know how to advance, there we go. Um, PDFX standard itself, well, the development ar uh, around it started in 99, 2000. The original standard, PDFX 1A standard, was released in 2001. And if you ask a, a standards organization to create a standard, then what you end up with is a whole list of standards because things can never be simple. So what you see on screen is a more or less complete list of uh, the PDFX standards uh, that at some point existed. I have to be careful because for example, PDFX2 doesn't exist anymore, it has been retracted. Uh, PDFX1 really never really existed in that form. What we use and know is PDFX1A. Yeah? But it is not just PDFX1A, there's a whole bunch of them. In fact, there are probably four that are worth remembering uh, if you uh, want to free up some space in your, uh, in your brain. The first one is PDFX1A, which is the, the oldest one, uh, which is a, a, a very commonly used one still. Um, I'll speak a little bit more about that in a second. The second one that you have to remember is PDFX4, which is a more modern version and the one that uh, in, in many ways we are moving towards uh, already in use, not as much as, as 1A in most cases, uh, but definitely a much more modern and competent standard in many cases. Then I think it would be good to know that something like PDFX 5N exists. And the only reason for that is that it's the only standard in that list that really deals with a multi channel or, or whatever you want to call that multi channel environment. So, environments where you're not working with RGB or CNYK, but you're working with CNYK plus red, for example. Um, and that's, that PDFX standard makes some provisions for, uh, for that. And then the last one that you should at least know uh, is uh, the name of is PDFX6, which is the um, 
well, which is the future. It's supposed to be what we, uh, what we will be using, I don't know, five years from now. Uh, I, it's dangerous to put numbers on, uh, on that. And PDFX6 is interesting because it's not built on PDF1 as all the other ones, but it's actually built on PDF version two. Um, not really used in practice at the moment because it's really hard to make PDFX2 files, let alone PDFX6 uh, files at the moment. So um, that's really future stuff. The two I want to give a little bit more detail about are PDFX1A and PDFX4 because those are the two that you'll, you'll find in, in the wild today. And PDFX1A is based on uh, PDF 1.4, which goes back to which version of Acrobats? Someone should know that. I think five. Yes? yes. Three or five. Yes, yes, there is an easy trick. You just add the numbers. Yeah. So PDF 1.3 goes with, uh, with Acrobat 4, PDF 1.4 goes with Acrobat 5. Um, and when we say Acrobat 5, we're probably saying, oh, I would have to think, but uh, we're probably uh, back to 2001, 2002, that kind of... Uh, so this is a standard that is, let's say, 20 years old. And it's still the most commonly used PDF X version out there and probably the most commonly used standard worldwide. The fact that it's so old has some advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that the PDF specification wasn't as big as it, as it is now. So a lot of the more complex stuff was, is not allowed in PDF X1A because it simply wasn't invented yet at that point. And that can be a good thing. It means that uh, you have less issues to process a PDFX1A file or to understand the PDFX1A file. The big problem with PDFX1A being 20 years old is that transparency had not been invented in PDF uh, at that point either. And transparency as a result is not allowed in that um, in that standard. So PDFX1A uh, is not capable, or I shouldn't say not capable, in, in a PDFX1A file, you should not have live transparency. And that's a very double-edged sword. It means that if you write a RIP, you can process PDFX1A files without knowing anything about transparency, which makes it a lot, a lot simpler. On the other hand, it means that every file that is created with transparency, which is just about anything these days, uh, has to be converted to a file without transparency. It has to be flattened. And transparency flattening is a very complex, and very error-prone process. It's the process that, uh, where you can start with uh, three objects, like three circles on a page, that overlap and when you go through transparency flattening, you end up with uh, seven different objects because they had to be cut up to uh, emulate the look of those different parts of the object without using transparency. So it's a very uh, error prone concept and in many cases it causes issues. One of the, one of the most well known issues is that you may end up with small white lines in between elements on the page because you're cutting up objects and then you're printing them very close to each other. And sometimes there is some kind of rounding error sometimes and you end up with fine white lines in between the, uh, the graphics. The other limitation in PDFX1A has to do with color spaces. And it supports only gray, CMYK and spot color. Uh, those are the only things that you can find in a file like that. So RGB is not supported um, and uh, a whole bunch of other uh, the, the RG, calibrated RGB and calibrated gray and LAB and all those things are not supported either. It has to be gray, CMYK or uh, spot color. 
when you look at the uh, the other one pdfx4 that you that i wanted you to remember uh, like i said this is the more modern version of uh, of this thing and what that means as well all the things that were not allowed in pdfx one a now are allowed in pdfx4 or at least a lot of those those things are allowed including things like transparency and uh, calibrated color spaces so i can have a cmyk file and it can contain an image, an RGB image that has an RGB ICC profile attached with it. And if that is constructed properly, then this can be a valid PDFX4 uh, file. Yeah. This is a much more modern standard, um, but as you can see from the things that are supported in here, it is also a much more complex standard, or at least it could be more complex if you have to rip PDFX4 files, for example, because of all these things that are uh, allowed in there. And then uh, before you start thinking that um, it's as simple as having PDFX and that's it, there are other ISO standards around um, a PDF. Uh, you also have PDFA, which stands for what? Archive. Yes, and then PDF UA. Oh, come Universal on, people. access. <laughs> yes. You're not going to let Dwight score all the points, are you? You have to add PDF R now. PDF UA is a structure, no? Yeah, uh, PDF UA is, yes, universal accessibility, which uh, it is not all about structure, yeah. but you need structure to have universal accessibility. Um, but saying that PDF UA is about structure is somewhat misleading because PDF A can also be about structure. Uh, some of the flavors require that as well. PDF E? Engineering. Engineering, yes. Uh, PDF H? Healthcare. Yeah, and actually, this is a lie because this is not an ISO standard. Uh, it follows the same naming convention, um, and if you search for it online, you should still find uh, find it mentioned here and there. But it's it's really not an ISO standard. PDF VT variable data, and where does the T come from? Transactional transactional. transaction. Yeah, so variable and transactional, and then the the. Probably the most recent one, although I'm not sure. I'm, I'm missing, like you said, I think I'm missing PDFR in uh, in the list here. Um, PDF VCR comes from video recorder. recorder. <laughs> yeah, a video <laughs> recorder. No. <laughs> Should be at least DVD. <laughs> it's. I always forget what it comes from. I think it is variable uh, content replacement, if I am uh, remembering correctly. Um, so it is, uh, it is also something that has to do with, uh, with variable data, um, uh, just as PDF-VT, but there are differences. Uh, otherwise, it would have been the same standard, obviously. And PDF-R was, if I'm not mistaken, is the, is the uh, standard um, that is supposed to be a replacement for things like faxed documents uh, and stuff like that, right? Ra raster. The raster uh, so uh, file. It's meant to be weighted to exchange images in a format that doesn't require a full PDF parser, basically. Yeah. Um, so there's quite a list of these, uh, of these things. Now, the good news is that they are, over time, growing towards each other. And if you would look at uh, PDFX, uh, at, at recent PDFX versions, and you compare them to PDFA and PDFUA, for example, then uh, the formats come very close to each other. Uh, a lot of the restrictions are very similar. A lot of the concepts are shared between the different ISO standards, uh, and that makes it a little bit easier. Actually, it is possible to, for example, create a PDF that is both PDFX and PDFA compliant. Uh, and one of, the, one of the first applications I know that did that was Quark Express. Um, so, there is a lot of different stuff going on, but it does, uh, 
the committees at least do exchange um, information. Now this is PDFX. So basically what happens is, uh, as I explained, you had PDF and then someone decided that PDF by itself was, uh, was not sufficient and uh, built a PDFX standard on top of that. Um, on the other hand, what happened, and, and this happened mostly in the US at the time, uh, PDFX really comes from development uh, from well, groups like DDAP in the US um, so it came very much from, from that angle. On the other uh, hand, at, this, at about the same time, there was a development from a Ghent work group. And Ghent work group, originally named the Ghent PDF work group, uh, is an organization that was started in uh, 2001. I'm actually not entirely certain it's January, but it was, it was about that, around that time frame. Um, it was an, it is an organization that was originally founded by a vendor, by Infocus. Uh, and I know because I worked for Infocus at the time. And the, the reason that that happened is because first in Belgium, but then afterwards also in uh, the Netherlands and in France and then in some other countries, um, the national organizations that group, for example, printers and publishers, started to realize that PDF was uh, becoming more and more interesting, but that there were no standards for uh, PDF. So um, they, they saw more and more people uh, creating advertisements in PDF, for example, but there was no real no guidelines about what you had to do. And rather than every country doing that by themselves individually, um, they, uh, they decided that it would be better to come together and try to come up with a standard that, was, that worked across multiple countries. Yeah. And it's not entirely coincidental that it started in Belgium. Belgium is very small. So if you want to do something in Belgium, it's very, you very quickly also, um, are in business with either the Netherlands or France or, or someone else. Uh, and if uh, those parties then would have different specifications, then that would make things really compli complicated. Um, if you look at this map, you have to excuse my geography because some countries are missing parts. It's not, I didn't mean that, but for example, France, I think loses some islands in my uh, coloring in. Um, that is not intentional. It's not a political statement. So the Ghent World Group was founded as far back as 2001. And the original mission, mission, mission statement, difficult word, uh, was to establish and disseminate process specifications for best practices in graphic arts workflows. Now, uh, all of the different parts in that are important um, and the two actions in there, establishing and spreading uh, these specifications, those are the key things that the Gantua Group still does today. So on the one hand, you have meetings where we try to develop, and I say we because I'm at the moment the executive director of the, of the, work, of the Gantua Group, so I take some um, ownership of it. So what we try to do is we, we come up with specifications or, and guidelines. And then the second part, and maybe even the most difficult part at the moment, or the most challenging part, is we also try to spread those so that people know that they exist and that they uh, know what to do with them and can use them. Yeah. Um, let me try to also open up uh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm just also um, also looking at chats to uh, to make sure that I answer questions as well. Um, and I was just reading Bart uh, your comments, and I'll I'll get back to that. Don't worry, we're we're getting there. Um, so. The two main tasks of the, of the group are to create these things and spread them around. And um, this is where we get to your point, uh, Bart. So what you, 
what could have happened, what could very easily have happened, is that the work that was done in the US on PDFX, or that started in the US, it was not solely uh, US, uh, but the work that, that originated there and the things that the Gantua group were doing could very easily have clashed. And in fact, the first Gantua group specifications were not built on PDFX at all. Uh, we basically didn't care. And luckily what happened is that uh, the people who were in the Gantua group started looking at, okay, so can we somehow bring these two things together? And what you see on the slide here is the differences between what happens at ISO with PDFX and what happens with the Gantua group specifications. Uh, anyone who has ever been to an ISO meeting will agree with me when I say that it's a very slow process. It's, it's very theoretical. Um, it is probably more accurate. Um, and what ISO did with PDFX was really create a global graphic art standard. So. Um, they made a standard that was supposed to work for the whole graphic arts industry. And now we're really getting to your point also, Bart, is um, if you make a standard for the whole graphic arts industry, then it is really difficult to do good for everyone in that industry. If you look at graphic arts, if you look at someone who is printing high-end photo books or glossy magazines, and you're looking at someone who is developing or printing, uh, I don't know, uh, car wraps or uh, something that will be uh, a banner or on the side of a building, then the technical specifications and what you have to take care of between those two things are so different that it's, very difficult to come up with one standard for both of these things. So what, what ISO did was create one global standard. What the Gantua group started doing was to diversify for specific market segments. And so from the very beginning, the, the Gantua group came out with, for example, a something that was called magazine ads specification. A specification for uh, PDF files that were used as an advertisement in a printed magazine and nothing else. And if you do that, then you can, uh, you can create something that is much more accurate than um, what ISO did or much more specific than what ISO did with PDFX. Russian dolls again. This is a much more accurate presentation or representation, I think, of what happens in real life. So if you look at PDF, ISO cut away a lot of the things in PDF that didn't make sense in graphic arts, and that gives us PDFX. What the Gantua group did was build additional specifications on top of PDFX. So a Gantua group file is always a PDFX file, uh, but it has a number of additional restrictions applied. And then what you can do in a company is apply additional restrictions on top of that. If you know that you're, uh, you're, you're doing commercial print work, you could use one of the sheet fed offset specifications from the Gantua group. But if you know that your jobs always have to have eight pages, you can add an additional requirement that says PDF has to have eight pages. Yeah? And then, it's big, then it is even stricter than what the Gantua group says. And that's the direction you have to look at this as well. Workflow specific ones or the company specific ones are typically more restrictive than the Gantua group specifications. The Gantua group specifications are more restrictive than PDFX, which is more restrictive than PDF. And by, by going in this direction, um, what was really avoided is that PDF is PDFX and, and Gantua group specifications living next to each other. In, instead, one is built on uh, the other. This is a bit of an old slide, but it's still, um, it's, it's still appropriate. What it shows is which things you can check or are checked in PDFX and which things are checked in Gantua group specifications. Yeah? And this comes back to the fact that the 
that PDFX is a standard for the whole graphic arts industry. So if you look at the second item there, low resolution, well, you can't check that in PDFX because what is low resolution in graphic arts? That depends on the market that you're, um, that you're in. Um, if you're doing a large formats, having a file that is 32 DPI might be more than what you actually need. Uh, if you're printing a magazine, 32 DPI is not going to cut it. So it really depends on the market segment. And as a result, that is not checked in PDFX. And the same for a lot of other things, uh, mostly things that go down to um, technical characteristics of the print process in, in different market segments and so on. Again, to our group, because it can make specifications for different market segments or it makes specifications for different market segments, can have those checks. And so in a magazine ad specification from the Gantua group, yes, you will have a check on low resolution images and it will be fine tuned for that particular market segment. Uh, so if you look at uh, PDFX, there is only PDFX 1A. Of course, we saw that there are different versions of the, uh, the standard that evolved over time. But um, if you look at the equivalent Gantua group specifications, there are a lot of uh, different variants. And what you see listed there are some of the original ones. So things for advertisements and then things for sheet fat offset. There were also specifications for web offset. And then in, in the years after that, the Gantua group also created specifications for packaging. There is now one for digital print. There is one for sign and display. So uh, the, the, there is a growing number of specifications, each one targeted at specific market segments uh, in, uh, in graphic arts. So a little bit of history about, uh, about that. If you look at the Gantt workgroup specifications, you'll find different names for them uh, because, well, over time things change and new specifications or new versions of the specifications are created. And uh, originally we very cleverly named the specifications 1v4 which comes from the fact that they are based on PDFX 1a, that's the one in there. Um, and it was, it happened to be version four of the uh, spec. So before that we had one V3. Um, no one understands where the naming convention comes from, but that's what they were called. I have to be careful with what I say there that this is the current standard. It was when I originally made this presentation, which was beginning of last year. Um, at the moment, there are certainly parts of the world where things have evolved uh, a little bit, but it's still a, a highly used standard. It is built on top of PDFX 1A, which means that any file that is compliant with this 1v4 standard um, has to be flattened. It cannot contain live transparency and it can only contain CNYK and spot color and uh, everything else that uh, PDFX 1A is restricted to. Okay. And then there is something uh, I have mentioned here, but uh, I would urge you to forget about this. Uh, the Gantua group released specifications that were called the 2012 specifications. Uh, this was a very good um, exercise for us to figure out where things needed to go, but in, in hindsight, they were probably not entirely perfect. What is much more important and what you should remember is 2015 specifications, and they're actually called that. So again, to a group 2015. Um, those were first approved in October 2015. We actually still deliver uh, flavors of that, the digital print and the uh, sign and display specifications that were that were finalized last year, I think, um, are part of this 2015 version of the Gantt Group specs because they're built on all the same uh, all the same things. This specification is PDFX4 compliant, uh, and if at some point you start uh, you start wondering. Um, which of these specifications should I use? 
then this is probably the biggest difference. So 1v4 is based on PDFX1A, and this 2015 one is based on, uh, on, on PDFX4. And that, of course, has repercussions. It means that uh, in the 2015 specifications, you can have live transparency and some other things. In the 1v4, you can't. So deciding uh, which version of the Gantt Group specs you use actually boils down to which version of the, uh, of, of the PDFX specification uh, you want. And that boils down to the fact, to the question, do you want to build this, uh, do you want to have, do you want to support live transparency or not? That's the first big question. And the second big question is, do you only want CNYK or are you okay with also having, um, having other colored spaces like, well, most notably RGB uh, in, uh, in those files? Okay, so um, I should actually stop that, uh, that here. That's a little bit of the backstory. And I saw some questions by, um, uh, and uh, I think Dwight has already answered some of the stuff in, uh, in, in chat as well. Um, yeah, the big question after this, or the, the big problem with these specifications is exactly this what should I use? And, and um, it's really difficult to answer that. In, in most countries where there is an active national organization, like for example, in Belgium, you have an organization for um, uh, working around uh, uh, advertisements for magazines and, uh, and, and, and newspapers. You have an organization that, uh, that brings together printers uh, of uh, commercial print work. And in most cases where you have an active association like that, the association will have a guideline. And then the best you can do really is to follow the guideline unless you have a relationship with the printer and you know that they can handle something else. Uh, and in general, that's a very that that's always uh, a very good advice. Try to if you know where where something is going to be printed, try seeing what that printer says. Whether they have something on their website, whether they have uh, templates or or indications uh, that they can that they can give you uh, that help you decide whether you want to do PDFX one A or PDFX four, and then preferably use one of the Gantt Group specifications that that follows that standard. Uh, the problem in, um, in, in, with the Gantt Group specifications is even worse than that in a way, because if you look at, so let me just, uh, let me just take the prepress color and transparency thing here in PDF toolbox. And then what you'll see is that there is a bunch of uh, PDFX profiles in here, but I also have this prepress section. And this prepress section actually corresponds to the Gantt Tour Group specifications. Now, you can see a whole bunch of them in here. And so it's not sufficient to decide which version you're going to use, um, but you also have to decide which of these things you're, uh, you're going to use, which of the, the, the different flavors you're going to use as well. Now, one thing that you will find meanwhile on the Gantt Group website is that for each of the different market segments that we deal with, uh, there meanwhile is a, a separate landing page. And each of those has information specifically for that particular market segment. So you can go there and see um, what, the, what documentation is available, what explanation is available. And then if you're ready to, um, to find, so if I would go to commercial print, for example, um, I can, uh, you see that there is a, a webinar and some other documentation supporting it. And you can go to application settings to download the, uh, the specification that you, uh, that you want. Yeah. Uh, the most, and I probably shouldn't say that in that way, but the most inoffensive Gantua Group market segment is this uh, sheet fat offset one. This has the, uh, it's, if you don't know what to use, if you have very little information where what you're creating is going to be used, 
then the sheet fat offsets uh, uh, version of uh, the Gantt specification is the uh, the most generic one. So that's always a, a good one to use. If you have more information, for example, because you're making an ad or because you are, uh, you know that you're going to be working for uh, sign and display or digital print or packaging, then you're always better to look at something that is more specific. But if you don't know what to use, this sheet fed offset one is a very generic one that you can use. Okay, let me see at, uh, and again, you can speak up if you want as well. This is about what I wanted to share. So if you have more questions, feel free to, um, to answer them. Um, I'm, I'm gonna look at the questions that were here. There is one about uh, JPEG and zip compression. That's, a, that's always an interesting one. Um, so when, when the Gantua group started, one of, the, one of the very big discussion points so this discussion goes back to at least 2001. One of the very big discussion points was whether uh, images had to be zip compressed or uh, JPEG compressed. And of course, the thinking was, well, but if you, do, if you use JPEG compression, you're, you have a chance that you're going to get JPEG artifacts and the quality is not going to be so good uh, and so on. And to a certain extent, it depends a little bit on the type of images you're dealing with. but. Uh, I do remember very clearly that we had people arguing that even for uh, pictures, um, you could always tell the difference between JPEG and, uh, and ZIP. And uh, we did an actual physical test at that point. People printed stuff that had been JPEG compressed with different compression levels and ZIP compressed. And uh, everyone was able to pick out certain files, but they never got it right. So uh, in reality, the difference between zip compression and JPEG maximum or JPEG high is really small. And it depends what kind of jobs you're doing. Um, the key so, difference is that the zip is what's called lossless, meaning what you put in, you get yeah. out 100%. JPEG, no matter what, is going to discard some information and hence going to give you a better compression. And of course, you can decrease the quality to throw away more data, but then you're going to eventually get artifacts. The, the key is to do your own testing to find out the quality settings that are acceptable to you. Um, and obviously a proof going through emails can be different than the final print edition too. So you may actually have multiple JPEG settings depending on the purpose, but zip is always going to be 100% guaranteed the original data and JPEG is not. And of course, the other yeah, factor is that the zip file is going to be a lot bigger than the JPEG compressed uh, file. So yeah, zip is usually a two to one compression pretty consistently and JPEG can be a hundred to one. But the other thing I always tell people about JPEG is if with zip, you could sit there and open the file, save it, open, save it, and you always get the same data. But if you use JPEG, every time you save with JPEG, uh, say out of Photoshop, it's going to lose more data. So even though yeah. I use max compression, if you open a JPEG, edit it and save as a JPEG, it's going to lose more data. And it's kind of like, you know, 10 people saying the same story in a line, by the end of the line, the, the story is going to be very different, right? So JPEG is not something you should use for editing. Uh, you should use something like PSD or, or TIFF with the uh, slate compression, zip compression. And editing is, you have to think about that a little bit wider than just editing in Photoshop, for example. If I make a, a workflow with PDF toolbox and different things, or it, the tool doesn't matter, but if I build a workflow where I'm going to do downsampling, for example, uh, and I'm going to do color uh, conversion from uh, RGB to CMYK or uh, anything else with images, if you have images that are JPEG compressed in a PDF file, every time you want to do something with them, you are going to go through an uncompressed, recompressed cycle, and you're going to have exactly what Dwight was mentioning in an editing workflow. Um, so you have to, when you start dealing with files that, that come in and that have JPEG compressed data, you have to think a little bit about what the workflow is you're going to send them through because you don't want to recompress them uh, three times. 
that would not be a good idea. Um, there are some exceptions to that as well, but then it, it, starts, it starts depending on the tool. Uh, for example, if in PDF Toolbox, if you have a JPEG file and you convert it to a PDF in PDF Toolbox, it doesn't actually re-encode. It simply takes whatever data is there and puts it in a PDF document. So you have no loss of data in that step. But as soon as you do a color conversion after that, yes, you're going to have a JPEG artifacts again. And so you could choose to process, take in a file that contains JPEG compressed images and as an output form, instead of recompressing them as JPEG after the downsampling you want to do or the color conversion you want to do, to save them as zip in the resulting PDF. But again, you have to take into account that the file is going to become uh, much bigger at the end. So then you have to make sure you can live with that. Um, and, and yes, and, and for JPEG, it's, it's, it's what we said before, you have to do your own testing, really, because in some cases, uh, the, the defects that you have in JPEG might become might be more visible. In other cases, they might actually be less visible. If you, if you want to have a really high quality images and then you print them on lousy paper, um, it might not make a lot of difference. So it really depends what, uh, what kind of workflow you're, uh, you're in. Another thing is JPEG is really good with um, photographic images, let's say, as opposed to say a, a PowerPoint presentation or a logo, something that has hard edges, you know, vertical, horizontal, diagonal lines, they're going to show up artifacts much faster than a photograph of a person. Yeah. So generally what we say is that if it's a synthetic image, meaning a computer generated image of a pie chart or a logo or a flow, you know, something that has structure in it, uh, use a, a lossless compression like zip. Um, and then if it's a photographic image, you know, people, nature, outside of a building, you know, whatever, then JPEG is a good choice for that. Any other questions? Well, there is. There was one remark, uh, uh, Leon. You made a, you make the remark that, uh, of course, when a company does multiple things, it becomes even more challenging because then you need multiple profiles and specifications, which is very true. There is nothing you can do about that, unfortunately. Um, well, I mean, packaging, commercial sign, and digital could all be uh, yeah. PFX, you know. Yeah, so what, just to give you some background on that, what the Gantua group did with the digital print specification was kind of interesting because if you, if you would start comparing specifications between uh, sheet fed offset and digital print, then they are largely the same, but the digital print one, we kicked out a lot of the requirements because uh, the digital print, in digital print, the RIP and the DFE and whatever, uh, just know how to deal with certain things that uh, that are much more of a problem in uh, in, in, in traditional offsets. So uh, those two profiles or, or specifications are very close together. They're certainly based built on the same on the same fundamentals. Um, the digital print one is simply a bit more relaxed than the. Uh, the traditional sheet fed offset one. The other interesting thing uh, or interesting specification is the one for sign and display or large format print, uh, whatever term you prefer. Because large format print or sign and display has in, its, in that market segment, you have the exact same problem as in graphic arts in general. I mean, if you, if, if someone tells you that they are printing for uh, sign and display, then that could mean that they're doing photo print. It could also mean that they're printing car apps. So the technical specifications vary very much between something like a photo book and a billboard or a car wrap or a building wrap. And so that 
posed a little bit of a problem because the Gantt Group specifications, for example, have um, uh, image resolution checks in them. Images that are too low resolution are failed. And how do you do that in a market like uh, sign and display? Because there is in that one market segment, there is already uh, so much uh, variation. Uh, we could have done two things. Uh, we could have made um, uh, different specifications for different types of products within sign and display, but then you end up with two trillion different specifications. So that's not very maintainable. Uh, then, what we did in the end was um, insert the concept of variables inside of the specification. So the specification basically says, okay, so first of all, we know that people very often deliver files not at 100%, but at a uh, smaller factor. So uh, if a billboard is uh, five by six meters, they're going to give you something that is 50 by 60 centimeters instead of five by six meters. And the, the idea is that the RIP will um, expand the file before it's printed. So there is a variable that deals with that in the specification, because that, of course, has an influence on what you do in terms of image resolution, checking, and, uh, and so on. And then the second variable is viewing distance. And the idea there is that um, you depending on the viewing distance. So depending on how far a typical person would be from the printed material, you need different technical guidelines. If I'm printing a business card that someone is going to pick up and, and look at close up, the quality has to be much higher than if we're talking about a billboard where someone is gonna be sitting in his car staring at this thing through a, a, a windshield that is probably dirty driving uh, uh, 80 kilometers an hour and being 50 meters away from the actual billboard. You don't need the same quality in both of these cases. And so that viewing distance uh, concept is also a variable in uh, the specification. So there is only one sign and display specification, but if you use it in, in software, uh, you have to somehow set the variables that you uh, that you want to be using. So you have to say whether the file that comes in is at 100% or, or not. And you have to indicate what the typical viewing distance will be for the job that you are checking, for example. Uh, and that's a, that makes that the specification is a little bit more complex. It's also more complex for, for software vendors to implement. But it's really the only way you can deal with a market like sign and display without creating 50 different specifications uh, or versions of the specification inside of the sign and display market segment. But yes, in a company where you do both packaging and commercial print, you're going to end up using different specifications for different types of work. It's the only thing you can do. Any more questions uh, from anyone? And no, Detlef, I'm not bringing you coffee. Um, you'll have to uh, you'll have to do that yourself, I'm afraid. Any opinions? So, any opinions on the slow implementation of newer PDFX standards? Yeah. Buy a faster computer. Lots of opinions. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I think there are different things playing uh, in there. Um, first of all, if you release a new specification, whether it's from ISO or from Ghent Work Group, it has to be implemented. So the people who write software have to implement it in their software. And that's not always a trivial, uh, a trivial thing. Yeah. Um, if you would look at what the uh, Gantua group is doing now with the next version of the specification, you would see that on the one hand, we're trying to make you were, we're trying to make the process a little bit more scientific or accurate um, by tightening up the descriptions of what we want to check for and so on. But on the other hand, we're also 
We've also identified ways of uh, making these things work better in a workflow, for example, by skipping false positives. And that is something that has to be implemented by vendors. Yeah, so that's the first thing you have to wait for. And then the second thing that you have to wait for is even if it's implemented by a vendor, even if this is in uh, the software that people are using, you have to get people to the point where they, uh, where, they cut, where, where they actually start using it. And that's not an easy process as well. So these things are, are slow, always. Uh, now, I don't know when you, uh, whether you remember something called PostScript. Uh, it also took us uh, a while to go from PostScript to PDF, so. Well, there was a reason for that. Because Adobe didn't want to go too quick. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and PDF was originally not made for the printing business, but it was yes, originally yes, yes. made for the, for the enterprise. That was but the it's, idea. It's, it's always two things, uh, Micha, as well. I mean, yes, it took a while before Adobe didn't, because Adobe didn't want to go uh, quickly. But my point is actually in the other direction. I, up to three years ago, when I gave demos for PDF Toolbox, and I told people that they could convert from PostScript to PDF and from PDF to PostScript with it, people were enthusiastic about that because they were still using that in, in, in some workflows. Luckily, it goes down over time, the percentage that gets really enthusiastic about that, but people are, are still using that. I mean, if you have a workflow that works, you need to have a good reason to change it or you're not going to change it. Back in the day, Post, PostScript was created by Quark in their engine and it took them a very long time to switch to a PDF engine from Global Graphics. But So, I mean, yeah. internally in Quark, they were generating PostScript and hence you had to take the PostScript and convert it to PDF as an extra step. Obviously, yeah, but that was had, had save as PDF. On the Adobe side, we, we did the, the same thing for a long time. For a long time, the advised method of creating PDF was generate PostScript and then redistill it uh, to, well, not redistill, distill it with Acrobat Distiller into a PDF file, um, which now a lot we, of people still fix problems with PDF by refrying it, converting it to PostScript and back to PDF. Absolutely. Magically fixes itself, but it also breaks a lot of stuff too. So don't refry your files. <laughs> Find a tool that can fix your PDFs without uh, converting into PostScript. Yes, but that's a very difficult thing to tell to people because it works. I've done it always. I mean, uh, if you go to large format printers, they will tell you that they open every file in Photoshop and, and generate a TIFF from that and then send that to Grid because it's more reliable. Um, how many large format printers convert all text to outlines because in that case it doesn't generate problems in the rip. Pay so, those printers with coins because dollars are too complicated. Uh -huh. But the old PostScript, the old PostScript interpreters, uh, it's, it's since the Adobe print engine that Adobe is ripping native PDF. Before that, they went from PDF to PostScript and then back right. to to bit. Correct. Right. So everybody who has an, an a rip without app is going to PostScript. But how many files today yeah. still have a rip without an app in it, or, or the equivalent of global graphics graphic stuff? Yeah. Global, global graphics, yes. Hmm? It's just it's just old machineries, legacy workflows out there uh, that for whatever reason do not get updated. And I know there are, especially, especially in large format, there are still some, what, what's the name of the ribs in large format? Uh, the one is... Caldera? I have Caldera. No, no, Cal oh, yeah, Caldera has, Caldera has a version one with and one without. The What's same is true with What's Onyx. That? What's that? Onyx Photoshop. Yeah. Uh, Roland Versa Works. But also yeah, there, so I, I think the situation changed also there. I think five years ago, it, you would probably find it easier to, to, well, you would have more large format rips that used PostScript. While I think if you look today at, at modern rips today in that market, the, the vast majority has uh, either a global graphics or, uh, or an Adobe rip in it. 
Yeah, Global yeah. Graphics Jaws, not Holoquin, is very, very popular in that market. And yeah. Jaws has supported PDF for years, way before Adobe. Mm -hmm. Correct. Most of the newer ones have APE. So the, the quality is definitely getting better on that end, but uh, it, these things take time and they always take more time than, uh, than we think. It's the same with the, 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 the change between, uh, and, and that actually is a, a good question as well. If you look at what, is, what happens today, why are so many people still using uh, the Gentoo Group 1 v4 settings that are based on PDFX 1A and haven't they switched yet to uh, 2015, which is based on PDFX 4? Um, and the answers are diverse if you start talking to people, but in some cases it's because it was set up that way and they don't modify it unless there is a problem. Uh, in other cases, it's, it's a genuine concern that if people can now send you files that contain transparency and, and, and RGB images, then you're going to have to convert them to, to CMYK and you're taking responsibility for it. So those transitions are not always easy. And, and in the print industry, there's always this tendency to maintain legacy systems as long as possible. And as long as you're not called Microsoft who says, I'm going to pull the plug on something, nobody's going to do it. Uh, I think that's in every industry, to be honest. And if I, uh, if I was printing a newspaper and I had to get the, those things out every morning, I would probably also be a little bit change averse support and upgrades are the first thing that gets cut in the budget, right? And that too, yes, absolutely. No, 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 no. I think the first thing is training. That's easier. What's that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um. Okay. Okay, so... Thank you. Um, I think we, uh, we will call it quits for now. Um, well, for this one, unless someone has uh, uh, questions they want to ask, but remember, this uh, the the whole purpose of uh, of this uh, four piece cafe thing is that if you have questions, just uh, just put them in the in the Facebook group or or email them to someone, and we'll we'll come back to them at uh, at some later point. Good, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thanks. Go have a drink now, a real one, and. Um, you know where to find us. <laughs>